Okay, now let's discuss in what sense this equation is not the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation. So let me define a shorthand for that mc divided by h bar. Let me denote it as mu so that we don't carry that over all the time. M c divided by h bar, I denote it as mu, and the equation then is mu squared psi is equal to zero. What I will do next is derive the continuity equation associated with this equation. So I will derive the continuity equation for this equation. Continuity. Continuity equation relates the time rate of change of the density, probability density, to the inflow or outflow of the probability current density, which in turn guarantees the conservation of probability, so it's physically very crucial, physically very crucial. So let's see whether we can get a proper continuity equation for that. What we are going to do is take this equation and take its complex conjugate. So this is the equation, psi is equal to zero. And let's take the complex conjugate of this equation, psi star is equal to zero, as we usually do for the Schrodinger equation. This is the normal pathway that we follow. Then we multiply this with the psi star and multiply this with psi. And psi are scalars. There's no problem in the ordering. But when we go to the Dirac equation, the order will be important then. Now here the order is not important. It's not the matrices, column or row, but they are just single scalar functions. Therefore, this is OK. Multiply and then subtract. Psi star mu squared psi, psi mu squared psi star, that's mu squared psi mod squared, both. They cancel. So what we are left with is psi star del psi minus psi del psi star is equal to 0. Nice. Well, this is a really nice equation. So let's uh, try to work out the details so that we can get the continuity equation from here. For this, we will remember the following. Here it is d mu, d mu. That's the definition of this box for dimensional Dalton version. And d mu, d mu. Then I use identities. How do I use the identity? Well, perhaps, although this is a trivial, uh, I know it's stupidly trivial for most of you, so still I will do it because sometimes I notice that there's a difficulty associated with this decomposition of this. Let me take the first term, psi star del psi, which is psi star del mu del mu psi, right? That's nothing but that. If you think of the d super mu psi is a different entity. So this is this times the derivative of the second, psi 1 and psi 2, if you, th if you like. Think of it that way. Then if you move this total derivative out, you can write this as psi star del mu psi minus the compensating term, right? I hope this is understood. OK, if so, let me repeat the same for the second term. But I'm not going to write that now anymore. That's the, the reasoning I would like to show. If so, then this equation is reduced to the following. There are two terms coming as the total divergences from both the first and the second. So I write it as d mu psi star del mu psi minus psi del mu psi star, this and the corresponding co one coming from the second term, minus d mu psi star d mu psi plus d mu psi d mu psi star is equal to zero. Equation is converted into this new equation. 
Can I cancel this last two? Why? Şaka yaptım belli tabii. <gülüyor> of course the answer is yes. I'm trying to confuse you. Well, the first one is D mu psi star. Do you hear this first one is D mu psi? Indices can be raised and lowered parallel, right? If you raise this and lower this, indeed it becomes identical. It was identical before, but even to make it look trivially identical, so it's indeed they cancel. And so we end up having the, with the first equation. That is the total divergence of something again of the four vector nature is equal to zero. Now let's give this a name. Let me identify that as the J super mu. It's a definition, nothing more than that. So the equation has the following form, D mu J mu is equal to zero. Nice. Sort of a conservation law. As I'm leading towards a conservation law, it is good to see that in, in at least in this compact form. How do I decompose this? D0 J0 plus DI JI. Right? D sub i is the gradient, Cartesian gradient, so we, I use that usual notation. So D0, J0 plus del J is equal to zero. Let's work out those J0 and J current vectors from that compact expression. What is J0? <coughs> J0. Psi star D0 psi minus psi D0 psi star, which is 1 over C psi star D psi DT minus psi D psi star DT. That's the first J0 term. What about the J vector? Well, meaning that the index is the super index. I associate the quantity with the super index with this uh, arrow thing. So what is it? Perhaps let me use the, I'm sorry, let me use the index notation. It's much, much more comfortable. Psi star di psi minus psi di psi star, right? If it is j mu, then if this is the super index is the i, then I can have that one. What is the meaning of this? d dx sub. That's subtlety, so it's much, safe, much safer to deal with the indices rather than directly putting in the arrow. Because this d super i is d dx i. This is not the Cartesian, this is the minus the Cartesian. Huh? So let me take it, the sign here. d psi d psi, oh, no, let me proceed. Psi here, psi star, d psi, now dx i minus psi d psi star d x i. So I gain this additional minus sign because of d super being d x sub and d x sub being minus the d super. Okay. So this is the j i. Okay, nice. So if I convert this into the vector, what is this? This the corresponding vector is the following. It's not equal to, but well, I can write it as equal. It doesn't matter. Minus psi star del psi minus psi del psi star. Now I use the Cartesian notation. So that is the J super i. 
if I write this as the this is a, I write it in the form of a safer notation, dji dxi, because you, it's the, the, there's a danger of making a sign mistake. Although that sign is not important, I want to do everything correctly. So this is safer that way. I know that d by dx super i is really the Cartesian divergence. And the J vector is this one. Then I have D0, J0, minus del J is equal to 0, because J is this. I put the minus sign in the front, okay. <coughs> so I know what J0 is, I know what J is. This J, as it stands, is not yet the non-relativistic probability current density. How do I write this? If I write this as h bar over 2mi times this, and if I put this compensating factor in the front, so my J becomes then equals J itself with the correct sign, 2mi divided by h bar times the J, the usual probability current density of the Schrodinger. Okay, if you write you can put the Schrodinger here. So, what do I have now altogether? I have 1 over C, 1 over C, d by dt, this expression inside. Let me write it instead of doing a shortcut. Minus the complex conjugate, this one. minus 2mi over h bar times divergence of j Schrodinger is equal to 0. Divergence of j Schrodinger. Now if I would like to convert it into the original cons continuity equation form, I have to move this factor to the left hand side and write it as minus h bar over 2 m i c d by dt psi star d psi dt minus the complex conjugate as a shorthand plus the divergence of j Schrodinger is equal to zero. Now we are getting there. Now focus on that equation. What do I want to see? I was trying to get something like d rho dt plus divergence of j is equal to zero. Well, in the Schrodinger theory, in Schrodinger theory, not only the quantum mechanics, rho is psi mod squared, which is positive definite, and then the sum is overall is infinite. J is h bar over 2 mi psi star del psi minus the complex conjugate. And this is related to what? It is related to the v velocity operator, right? Psi star velocity operator and psi, and of course, plus the complex con permission conjugate divided by 2. Well, this is something important. The current should have a physical meaning. It must correspond to the motion in the, in the correspondence sense. 
Because if there is a decrease or increase in the probability density, it means if it, there is an increase, there must be something moving into here. So if there is a motion in the classical sense, it must be associated with the velocity operator. So therefore, this, with all these dimensions and constants and everything, it's the correct current. That's the reason why I wanted to make this correct current appearing in here, because it has this explicit meaning. If the current part is adjusted with the known information coming from the non-relativistic part, we have to check whether we have been equally successful in getting a positive definite, if not this one, something still positive definite probability density. Now, focusing on that expression, you see it's more or less hopeless. What do I mean? Look at that thing. Now, I will focus on that expression. Let me, let me write it over there. We have adjusted the current part to be associated with the actual velocity in the classical sense, so that there is, it represents a motion, in motion out. But now, see, probability density part came out as d by dt <coughs> minus, minus h bar over 2 mi c mci if you want mci psi star d psi dt psi d psi dt this is the first part is this one so if it is to be interpreted as the correct continuity equation, this part should be identified, should be identified as rho. Some kind of probability density can be. Does it have the proper properties, right properties, that a probability density has. Let's see. It should be positive definite in the first place. The second term is the complex conjugate of the first. Correct? If you want to move in the minus sign in here, the inside is the following. Psi d psi dt minus the complex conjugate divided by 2i times h bar over mc. What is the psi d psi star dt minus the complex conjugate divided by 2r? If it is a complex number, it is a plus ib minus a minus ib twice i times b, two i's cancel, and this portion is the imaginary part of the psi d psi dt. And times h bar over mc. It's interesting that h bar over mc, which appeared in the equation in the mu, mu, remember? Mu was, we define it to be mc over h bar. And it appears here as 1 over mu. <laughs> mu is a constant, positive obviously. The imaginary part of that function, is it always positive? Is there any reason why imaginary part of an arbitrary complex function to be always positive? Think of the simplest, simplest complex function, z itself, right? F is z. Z is x plus i y. What is the imaginary part y? 
y can run from the minus infinity to plus infinity all the time. Is there anything which stops it running in the minus infinity side? No. So this is an arbitrary, well, in general complex function. An imaginary part is a general function and it can have any sign. It can be a positive and negative. Is there a positive definite part in it which I, we can identify? Perhaps you can think of the following. Put the d by dt psi mod squared. What is, the, what is in d by dt psi mod squared? Psi star d psi dt plus psi d psi star dt. Therefore, psi d psi star dt is equal to d psi star dt is equal to d by dt psi mod squared minus psi star d psi dt, right? Therefore, you can run the imaginary part. There is no imaginary part coming from here. So either you have imaginary part of psi d psi star dt or minus psi star d psi dt. That's even more manifest that it can have minus psi. You see? So this doesn't have a definite positive, positive definite sign. Meaning, it cannot be a probability density. A physical probability density, you throw a dice, you say, I have minus 10% of getting 6-6. Six, six. Minus 10%. Probabilities are positive definite numbers. Therefore, you see we have a serious pathology coming in here. Not acceptable. No, there is no positive definite probability density satisfying the continuity equation. So this is not the correct equation. Well, people do not want to give up easily, right? They said, oh, perhaps we can find a way out. Way out. Is there a way out? Staying in the same frame, framework, is there a way out? Well, in order to really formulate the way out recipe, we have to remember what we have used. We have used the a squared c squared, p squared, plus m squared, c to the 4 as an operator equation, right? h is the energy operator. It's a quadratic equation. If you now look at the geometrical profile of this energy momentum dispersion relation, it's a, in the even classical sense, let's do it in the one dimension. Here is the e axis, here is the p axis. And what is the form e squared minus c squared p squared? Of course, there are the asymptotes of these hyperbola. They are the word line of the light equals cp, right? This hyperbola, this light cone is e equals cp. So they are, they are the word line of the light. And this is the energy momentum dispersion relation. And there is a negative energy. Uh -huh. There is the negative energy, is that right? Could that be the clue towards a positive solution? That's the correct solution. Because this two branches of the hyperbola, right? There is the lower branch, which are associated with the negative energies. You said negative energies. There is no such thing in the Newtonian mechanics. Now, obviously, there is a room for negative energies in this game. Then, Perhaps instead of using this full equation, we can think of taking the square root 
as an operator equation. But even the primary school students know that there's a plus and minus. This thing is there. Whether you like it or not, the lower parabola, the negative energies are there. Well, this way, we are throwing away an important part of the physics. If you are willing to throw away this important part of the physics, that's the negative energy solutions, you can say perhaps this square rooted equation may give us the correct solution. And you say, why do you think so? Well, the reason why I think so is the following. Look at this equation, the continuity equation. Continuity equation forces you to identify this as the rho. Remember, quadratic, in the quadratic form, quadratic version, we had rho equals 1 over mu imaginary part of psi del star, the, the, the psi star dt. You can, I try to identify the reason of this difficulty, the pathology. The presence of this additional derivative really ruined everything. If there was no d by dt in here, you would have psi and psi star, and it, wouldn't direct, it would be directly psi, psi star. There would be no reason of getting imaginary part of this complex function. In order not to have an additional d by dt entering into the row, you say perhaps I should not start from the quadratic version, I should start with the linear d by dt version, which is the square root of the equation. Linear d by dt version is that version. Indeed, the left-hand side is h is i h bar d by dt. Then if I want to work out the continuity equation, it will indeed give me the d by dt psi mod squared. But it's a square root operator is problematic. You are trading off one difficulty with the other. Why do I say so? There is one price, one, one really big price is throw, throw away the negative energy solutions without any justification. The first. The second, then it is this square root operator. Let me write that down. What, is, what would be the form of the equation in this case? Except that price we already paid, the big price of throwing away the negative energy solutions <coughs> without worrying about it. I say here is the c squared del squared minus c squared h bar squared del squared plus m squared c to the 4 psi is equal to 0. That is the new equation now I, I propose. This portion will work out fine. It's like the Schrodinger, right? I h bar d psi dt, therefore it's going to give me d by dt psi mod squared. What about this portion? What is the meaning of this operator? The meaning of this operator is the following. If I write this as mc squared times 1 minus h bar squared divided by m squared c squared, del squared to the power of one half. That's the definition of this. H bar over mc is one over mu. So one over mu squared. So simplified somewhat. mc squared is quite nice. Let's keep it out there. Because m, m squared c to the four comes out as such. One minus del squared over mu squared. Does it have the correct dimension? Yes, it does. One over the length. This is 1 over the 1 over the length, so it's dimensionless, and this is dimensionless, correct. So what is the meaning of this operator? The meaning of this operator is the following. If you write this as 
Mm, let me invent an, a notation. Delta is an operator. Delta squared over mu squared I define as delta. So it is one minus one minus delta to the one half. So I write this meaning. The meaning of this is the following. One minus one over two delta minus squared is plus one half, one half minus one divided by two factorial delta squared plus one half times one half minus one times one half minus two divided by three factorial delta cube and all the way to infinity. That is delta squared over mu squared delta squared over mu squared squared delta squared over mu squared to the 27 delta squared over mu squared to the 128 all the way to infinity that is pathological any theory which contains anything higher than the second derivative first derivative squared they are called higher derivative theories that they contain ghosts negative negative uh, norm particles, pathological. Infinitely many derivatives. It goes all the way to infinity. Delta squared mu squared, delta squared squared, delta squared mu squared to the third, delta squared mu squared to the 27, infinity. So it's not defined and it's the, if it is defined in this way, it contains negative norm states. Again, negative norm. Norm, norm is problematic. Ghosts, we call them ghosts. Contains ghosts. So, not only, not only negative energy is ruled out, negative energy solutions are thrown away. thrown away. Also, there are infinitely many derivatives. Ghosts negative norm states. Again, negative norms. So, whichever way you try, there is no way that you can save this beautiful equation as the right relativistic quantum mechanical equation. So, we drop it here to be picked up later at the field theory level. So, in search of correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation, now let's search for that. We have, this was an unsuccessful attempt, a simple and beautiful attempt, but unsuccessful. But we, at least we, it, it taught us some lessons. The lesson is that if you have quadratic time derivatives is problematic, it really leads to non-negative, non-positive definite probability densities. The, the degree of derivative should be, it, it should be first degree in time derivative. So criteria, equation should be first degree in time derivative well if it is first degree in time derivative then it should be first degree in space derivatives as well that's the principle of relativity, space derivatives as well.
Why? Because we know that space and time are the coordinates of the same for moment, for vector. They are of the same status. There is no difference in physical terms between time and space. If one is in first degree for relativistic invariance purposes, then the space part should be also first degree derivatives. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee the invariance of the or covariance of the equation under relativistic transformations, which are called Lorentz transformations, right? So that's the second criterion. Well, that's enough. So we are really, we have listed the first two mathematical criterion stemmed from physical requirements. Invariance under four-dimensional rotations. So let's start writing, the, we are constructing the equation now. Let's write the equation I h bar d psi dt. Let's start with this one mimicking the Schrodinger equation. The left-hand side of the Schrodinger equation is i h bar d by dt. Well, actually, I'm writing the first derivative. And to make everything come out to be consistent in, in uh, constants and everything with the Schrodinger, I write it i h bar times d by dt. I don't have to, but I write it that way. And I'll do the same in the right-hand side. Well, first of all, we'll have d by dx1 the Cartesian ones are the super ones. And let's put a constant in the front. Let's generate some space in here. Plus alpha 2 d by dx2. Plus alpha 3 d by dx3. Here are the first degree space derivatives written as they are first derivatives, obviously, they, have, they are to be multiplied with constants, nothing else. But what are the nature of those constants? We don't know yet. Let's proceed. And we have to have something in this equation which reflects the physical nature in here. If p's are sort of the gradients, h bar over i d, so I'm writing sort of the momentum operator, right, d by dxi. In order to ensure indeed that it's momentum operator, let's put in a c h bar over i in here. That c is obviously just the c coming from here, d by dx0 is the ct, I move the c up. All these constants are put in by hand so that things come out to be clean. This version or that version, they are all the same. The definition of the constants will depend on the choices. So V introduce the alphas in such a way that they are factored. I make the h bar over i appear in, in here so that h bar over i times d by dx1 is the momentum, right? P1 and P2, so that I recognize the physical things. Although they are mathematical, this is a mathematical notation, I, there is physics behind it. d by dx1. What is it? It's related to the p1, d by dx2 related to the p2, etc. Then I go to this equation. This is the one, it, it's the underlying physical principle, energy momentum dispersion relation. If everything was massless, there would be no, no term m. It would be just the Hamiltonian and the momentum. And if you take the square root easy, h equals plus minus cp. h is i h bar d by dt, p is c times h bar over i d by dx. So if I write this only, it looks as if it's the square root of that. But the actual square root of the Hamiltonian contains more stuff. It should contain mass. What I'm doing is really, nowadays in modern terminology, I'm taking the square root equation. But taking square root is a sophisticated way of taking the square root. So that m should appear, otherwise it should correspond to a massless equation. It's a massless object, so I put an mc squared and introduce another constant. As I am free to in in introduce constants to determine eventually one constant, two, three, and four. Here is the equation. I have constructed the equation to be such. 
Based on the two requirements, it is first-degree in time derivative, first degrees in space derivatives to be, to be consistent with the theory of relativity. If the degrees do not match, you can never ensure the relativistic invariance or covariance. And in order to ensure that we represent a massive object in, in full agreement with that energy momentum relation, taking the square root, you say, how do you take the square root, each of them square rooted separately? That's the ingenuity of the Dirac, really. So this is the equation and we'll proceed to determine alphas and betas so that we'll have the beautiful Dirac theory at the end of the day. <laughs>